Hi, my name is Buck Perley. I'm a senior software engineer at Unchained. I've been primarily working on our wallet infrastructure team. And one of the, the pieces that, that my team tends to work on as, as part of those responsibilities is our open source. And so today, what I wanted to talk about was a little bit about our open source strategy at Unchained, how we view it as part of the larger Bitcoin ecosystem. What we're going to be talking about today in this video is what is open source for those that are that don't really spend their days thinking about code or are worrying about it too much, just like to use the software. I think it's important context to talk about what is open source versus closed source. What do we even mean by those words? Uh, then I'd like to talk about from a broader standpoint, a higher level. Why is it important? Why should we even care? And then I'll talk a bit about how we view open source at Unchained, how it fits into our overall strategy. And finally, I will introduce some of our open source code that we maintain that anybody can inspect and run on their own. So let's jump into it. What is open source? So when we say that word, open source or closed source, what we're talking about is the source code. Typically, when you're running an application on your phone or on your computer, even in a website, you're really interacting with compiled code, uh, code that has been turned from the source code that is human readable, that developers write, that we can understand and read and review. It gets compiled down into code that machines or browsers can run. Now, when we're talking about it, whether it's open or closed, what we're talking about is if that source code is open for the public to view. Sometimes open source can just be uh, just for that those inspection purposes. And other times it is completely free to use, not just to look at the code, but also to use it as you see fit, to fork the code, as we call it, and create your own applications from it, even build a business on top of it. So open source can actually encompass a pretty wide range. Closed source is actually most of the applications you probably interact with in your day-to-day -day life are going to be closed source. So when you download uh, an application from the App Store, for example, you're going to be downloading the binaries that have been compiled and sent to the App Store. Sometimes companies will release their code that is the source uh, to be inspected if people want, but it's hard to verify that they're the same thing. Uh, and yeah, so even websites, though, that you're interacting with, there's a lot of pieces of it, even if you can see this, the code that's running in your browser, that might not be open to the the wider world. Now, I, th I think one of the reasons why a lot of companies will default to closed source is primarily, honestly, it's just uh, for simplicity, for uh, kind of like ease of development. You don't always want to air your dirty laundry to the outside world. It takes a lot more maintenance to, to prepare code so that um, you, you can have others review it. Sometimes it's in intellectual property concerns. Code is what we write. That's our work. That's our output. And so oftentimes some companies will want to keep that closed so that uh, others can't copy them. So typically the way that I like to think about when code is generally closed source is if it's going to be a platform that is impractical or um, undesirable for people to be running on their own, right? So you're relying on the organization that maintains that code to also be running it for you. In those scenarios, it typically makes sense for it to be closed, generally speaking. Now, for the open source side of things, there's a few, few reasons why it can be beneficial to have your code open source. So when I say audit the code, what do I mean? So, you know, a lot of people might think of, you know, like a tax audit. Uh, and that can be kind of what it is, right? If you're auditing code, you, it can be very invasive. Um, you are allowing people to, to see the work that you've done, the good and the bad and the ugly. But that can be beneficial, right? When you're dealing with money, like when you're dealing with Bitcoin, this is why the Bitcoin core software really has to be open source because this is a decentralized network that anybody can run that is of critical importance to people's livelihoods or life savings, etc. Now, a lot of the times we'll hear people say, well, you know, the code is right there. You can audit it. In reality, not everybody is going to audit the code that is on their, their machine that they're going to be running. And that's fine. We shouldn't expect everybody to be a super coder that is able to understand the C++ that's, that's built, um, that's used to build Bitcoin. I kind of think of that, about it like a terms of service, right? Uh, where, you know, have this 100 page like legal document that you just clicked, said, yes, I agree. And well, you probably didn't really read it. But when the text document is out there, when it's out there, 
sometimes there is there are people that spend their time reading them just because they're curious, because they want to make they are actually super paranoid. And if they catch something, that benefits everybody. And that's the real core uh, idea behind open source: is that when a change happens, when a vulnerability is discovered. Everybody kind of benefits from that process. Just because you are not able to audit the code doesn't mean that it, you still don't get the benefits of that. But we still have to hope and expect and encourage people to do that. Sometimes some people just like to verify、um, that the code is doing what the developer that wrote it says it's doing, and you can do this at varying levels of the of. Complexity within the code. Sometimes it's just an,、uh, um, the idea of verifying builds. This has become a really important part of the Bitcoin ecosystem recently. Even if you can't audit the code very carefully yourself, you can take the source code, compile it, get a hash, which is basically a stamp that is、uh, that verifies the version that you created, and then check that against the compiled code that is released by the developers, usually accompanied by some. A、cryptographic signature, and finally, if you are even、uh, mildly, you know, technically inclined, you could be running an application, find a bug, or want to understand how it works, and you might be, not be going through the deep innards of an application, but you can poke around at it and maybe find a bug, maybe resolve something, or even just help the developers to、uh, themselves figure out what's going on. So you report a bug and you say, "Oh, and I was looking at the code, and I think it's related to this." That really helps us a lot. Just adding more details and context so that、uh, it's it's faster and easier to to respond to issues. When code is open source, it means that anybody can also use that within their own code or application. There's a there's a famous book、um, that was written, I believe, in the '90s, called "The Cathedral and the Bazaar," and it it highlights this difference of of、uh, building something that is closed source that is like very tightly controlled. Uh, and that would be the cathedral, and you can build some very beautiful、uh, monuments in that way. And the bazaar, which is this chaotic, teeming kind of、uh, mass of humanity, but in that bazaar you have so much creativity, so much movement, so much flexibility. And so there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But that、uh, that open network, that open idea of the bazaar, gives us a, a lot of flexibility and.、Um, Uh, really, momentum as we we build. When you make your code open source, you can immediately, automatically tap into a global potential workforce. Anybody that looks at your code, especially if it's publicly hosted on a platform like GitHub, anybody can contribute to it as well. Now, if you're a startup or you just have an idea that you're experimenting with that you hope works out. Being able to have other people contribute is a is a real like step function、uh, improvement in what you're able to produce. And then sometimes you can find people that are really enthusiastic about what you're building. They start contributing as things grow. Maybe you are able to hire them as full time employees. And finally, it helps to push standards forward. So if we have certain standards within the Bitcoin ecosystem or any really open source ecosystem, and you're trying to push forward a standard that you want others to adopt, if you create libraries, code, applications that leverage or implement These standards, it can really help to gain adoption, as opposed to having them closed source, where people are just trying to copy you in a much more opaque process. Now we've talked about what open source is versus closed source, why it's important in a general、uh, kind of framing. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how we think about open source at Unchain and why it's important. Our open source really kind of started to pick up, and, and we we started to spend. More time thinking about this as a core part of our offering when we came out with vaults and our custody products, and we started to expand beyond just loans. And the reason was because this was starting to expand our general collaborative custody offering. We were not just offering a multi-sig loan wallet where we controlled the keys, but we were offering collaborative custody where our customers were controlling the keys, and we were just one of the signers. And what this meant is that as a Bitcoin native financial institution, we wanted to build Bitcoin native tools. And so one way to think about this, especially as we were building out vaults where we were only one of the key holders, we wanted to make sure that our customers always felt. That their funds were secure, even if there was any risk that Unchained should go away. We didn't want you to have to trust us. We wanted you to feel comfortable that you always had control over those funds, and we were just a partner in that overall process. So the way that we thought it was best to approach that framing was to provide tools that could be used to recover funds even without needing Unchained. Right, so this this meant that you didn't have to rely on us to run servers for us to have a platform that you could log in. You could just spin up your own application, 
recover your wallet, spend your funds. And this this is really something that we wanted to, to provide for our customers. And in order to do this in the most impactful way possible, we believed it needed to be open source. So the idea was we wanted to build something that anybody could look at, inspect, audit for themselves, that they could run themselves to interact with their unchained uh, the funds that they were storing in their on-chain vaults. In addition to that, we didn't just build an application, but, but we built out libraries that are used in that application, as well as our own platform on-chain uh, that our customers are using. And these libraries are basically utilities that uh, are able to, that they're basically helper libraries, you could think of them as, to, to do common uh, common actions that a developer might need to do in their code when they're working in a multi-sig environment. With that, I'd like to talk a little bit about our open source code. Our code that we manage, we call Caravan. This is on the, this is an entirely JavaScript type of ecosystem. This is a web app, our Caravan coordinator that you can run on your own. And it relies on several utility libraries as well. Here we have our Caravan monorepo. Monorepo just means it's one repository of code that's split up into many different projects. And we have apps and packages or libraries. So the app right now is just the Caravan coordinator. And anyone who has been using, has been a customer of Unchained will be familiar with our Caravan multi-sig, uh, stateless multi-sig coordinator. We have a Caravan multi-sig.com. Now, even though you're navigating to a domain when you're going, going here, and this is the, typically how we reference our, this open source application, it feels like it's a hosted app, uh, app, right? It's one that might be closed source. And for most people that are not technical, they don't really have to care one way or another about it. But in reality, this is actually coming directly from our code that's hosted here on Caravan. And we have some automated ways that's deployed. But the real advantage of having this open source is that anybody can take this code and run it for themselves. You don't have to go to caravanmultisig.com if you want to run this, if you want to verify your balances, if you want to interact with your wallet. You can copy the code yourself, fork it here on GitHub, uh, download it for yourself, and, and run it. So what that will look like is here I have a version of Caravan that's already downloaded on my machine, of course. And once you've... We'll run an install. This is all set up already, but this is what you would do the first time you, you set it up. And you can see even doing something like this, it, it reports on some vulnerabilities, uh, which we, we update and fix periodically. Um, another advantage of open source. And then I run this command, and it will build all of the library, all of the code. And you can see here that we have a version of Caravan now running locally from my machine. Here we have Caravan running locally on my machine, uh, just a local server that's running from the code that was copied directly from GitHub. And what you're, you'll be able to see is when I import a wallet. When I import a wallet, you can see here that the XPubs get loaded up and I have a wallet. This actually, this wallet happens to come from our test suite, which is also in the Caravan application. Once I confirm that, it will check uh, the way that I'm checking the balances here is with mempool.space, so just an open API. It gets the balances, and here you can see uh, an address that has some funds on it. I can even copy it, go to mempool.space, copy that address in, and see, indeed, this has a balance right here. And you can get other addresses from here as well. Receive and send, interact with your devices. So this is Caravan. This is hosted locally and available for anybody to look at the code as well. Now, another important piece of this that I discussed earlier is about the library. Now, what are libraries? Libraries are, if you think about the coordinator, uh, the primary user of the, of the coordinator would just be kind of end users, right? Anybody, you don't have to be technical. You can run it. You can go to the domain name, uh, caravanmultisig.com to interact with it, and that's fine. Libraries, on the other hand, we would think of the primary users being other developers. So if we look at the packages that we have available right now in Caravan, you can see here we have um, our primary ones are Caravan Bitcoin, Caravan Clients, Caravan PSPT, and Caravan Wallets. These are libraries that anybody can install in their own application. 
and use as they're building out their own multi-sig tools or anything else. Uh, libraries will tend to be utilities for the way the ones that we've built for interacting with uh, Bitcoin transactions, maybe parsing PSBTs. We have another uh, library called Caravan Descriptors, which allows you to parse and encode descriptors. And so again, the advantage of this is these are tools that we not not only use in our open source uh, coordinator application, but we also use within the Unchained platform itself as well. So we get all the benefits of the security, the ability to audit that we get from the open source world, and we get to leverage that in the in the platform that our that our customers use. And now this is something that we intend to build out more in the future. Uh, right now, Caravan Bitcoin is actually a lot of mini modules essentially you can see there's one for dealing with fees we have fixtures for running tests uh, interacting with with extended public keys as well and our goal is eventually to get to a point where you, each one of these will be individual packages that a developer can install themselves so the idea would be if you're a developer that you want to build an application that is uh, interacting with psbts all you can do is install the caravan psbt library and you can benefit from that without having anything else uh, attached to it so while we've been maintaining our open source uh, libraries for for several years now uh, there's still a lot more that we want to do. There's ways that we want to extend the Caravan Coordinator application to have uh, broader uh, device support. We recently just added descriptor support as a way um, to, to show like the direction that we're moving in. We want to introduce more libraries that other developers can use. And uh, also more applications. We think that there's an, uh, a, w- uh, a space to develop smaller, kind of like more purpose-driven applications that can be very easy for uh, anybody to interact with and also developers to contribute to. Uh, so we, because again, one of the things that we'd like to do is not just to make it easy for people to use this code, but also easy to iterate on, to develop on, to constantly be improving. So thank you very much for uh, joining me for this walkthrough. I hope you learned something about uh, different strategies for developing code, doing open versus closed source, and the benefits that come alongside with it. And if this is something that you're interested in learning more about or even contributing to yourself, if you have some ideas for uh, how we can continue to grow and improve our open source, I highly encourage you to reach out to us um, on any of the the social platforms. Uh, So thank you again. Talk to you next time.